We started our Wyoming wanderings on U.S. Route 30, the old Lincoln Highway. It was the first transcontinental highway in the U.S. It doesn't seem like there's a lot to see at first, but we've been told once you begin to understand the area, there's more here than meets the eye. To learn more, we headed to Western Wyoming Community College in Rock Springs. We wanted to meet the preeminent geologist in Wyoming, Charlie Love. His father and mother mapped out most of the state. They dragged Charlie along. This probably accounts for his love of everything Wyoming, especially its rocks. All of these rocks were actually part of a little project that I had in which I wanted to bring the field to the campus because I had students who could not go on our field trips. This one is part of the Bighorn Dolomite. And we've got a great big uh, nine inch Macrorides in here, which is a huge snail. And right next to it, we have about two and a half feet worth of a chambered nautilus that was originally probably five feet long. See, here's a great big snail in cross section right there. It's a classic example of life that was uh, living in western Wyoming about 430 million years ago. This boulder is something we call taconite. It is an iron ore. This thing weighs 10 tons and 50% of it is iron. And it was laid down on the oceanic floor in uh, the Wyoming area about 2.8 billion years or so ago, uh, plus or minus about 20 minutes. Charlie brings a great deal of passion to his work and it's infectious. Not only has he assembled a great collection out front, he's also put together an exhibit of life-size dinosaurs that once roamed Wyoming. These creatures lived here millions of years before human beings. Wyoming was between the mountains and the ocean. So this part of Wyoming and Colorado and Montana and parts of Utah all contained the same materials shed off these mountains and there were streams that went across them like so. The end result was dinosaurs fed on the vegetation near the streams. Sometimes the streams would flood, drowning the dinosaurs along them, and they would be fossilized right in the riverine sediment. Charlie offered to give us a tour of discovery for fossils and more. He took us on a day-long trip. The first quest, find fossil snails. This spot is readily accessible just off US Highway 80. The thousand vertical feet of uh, clay shale that you have in the face of White Mountain was laid down in Lake Gosiut. You'd be in the middle of that lake standing right here if it were 50 million years old. Millions of shellfish died and settled on the bottom, forming what is now a white band of limestone. The layer of snails is such that we have um, calculated there are probably more than six trillion snails. There are plenty to go around, and there are no restrictions on collecting these mollusk fossils. All along the road are similar sites that are part of the same White Mountain fossil layer. We're on I-80 headed west, and we're going about three miles west of Rock Springs, and we're getting off on exit 99. Here we found something a little different. At the same time snails were moving in, clams started to thrive in Wyoming. There's mother of pearl still left in some of these clams from 50 million years ago. Fossil hunting is a good activity for a car full of children. It's a wonderful way to have kids let off steam because if they've been riding in the car for any length of time, they need to get out, they need to scramble around, and they need to have some incentive or motivation to do it. These fossils are certainly a, a terrific way. Our next stop off Highway 80, the Wild Horse Loop. This remote 50-mile route sits atop White Mountain. County Road 50 is a gravel road, and there are no services, but the views are fantastic. Kiosks tell visitors what they're seeing. It's a great place to see the ancient migration path that Native Americans once used. They were followed by settlers and wagon trains who called it the Overland Trail. Then came the Union Pacific Railroad. Then later, as automobiles developed in 1917, they uh, passed a transcontinental highway. It was ultimately called the Lincoln Highway. It was built right literally over where the old Overland Trail was. And perhaps in the future, we'll go back to using the railway for passenger transportation. We shall see how, how high the price of oil reaches before that becomes a brand new idea. 
we go back to riding horses, this is a good place to start. There are approximately 2,500 wild horses that call this area home. Horses are the symbol of the American West. It didn't take long for the horse to be taken up by Native Americans after the Spanish brought them here in the 1500s. Some of these are probably descendants of the Spanish horses. Others have been turned out by ranchers or lured away by other wild horses. Coming off the top of White Mountain, we headed north to Wyoming 191. We turned off at Sweetwater County Road 417 and headed into the Great Divide Basin. Everything to the east of here drains internally. To the west, it drains to the ocean. For thousands of years, this was a migration path for different Indian groups. You can still find their drawings or petroglyphs. We're in a place they now call the White Mountain Petroglyphs, and it's only one set of uh, several different petroglyphs that are within the region. This is just one of the nicer ones. Undoubtedly, there were several different groups, maybe as many as four different groups, both in time and place. Certainly, there seemed to be the mark of Shoshone here. There's even some what we would call Fremont culture from roughly, uh, oh, say, 800 to 1100 AD. There's also several unknown groups whose art styles are all different. And I'll show them to you when we get up here. See, you know, that one looks very much like an elk. Native American spiritual leaders believe the petroglyphs were created for religious purposes. There are hundreds of drawings of elk, buffalo, horses, and different human figures. While it's hard to date all of them, there are some clues, like the drawings that show a man on a horse. You can see that they uh, put on the horse's mane and even the, the feathers down from him. He's carrying a lance. And there's another one showing the same kind of thing. Probably those are Ute or maybe even Shoshone, but they'd be post-horse, so to me they're post-1700. Post Seeing that we were becoming hooked on Wyoming, Charlie invited us to tag along on a four-day field trip. His geology class met at the campus early in the morning and climbed aboard a waiting bus. Charlie would be our combination tour guide and driver. He gave us a briefing about what we would see and where we'd go. What matters to you, notice that up at the top, you have a list of where you are in Wyoming. The goal was to learn to read the story of the earth by understanding Wyoming's geology. It would take more than a four-day field trip to become fluent in this language, but this full immersion excursion would give us a start. We headed north out of Rock Springs on Highway 191, then turned on 28 as we followed the route of the old wagon trains. Just beyond South Pass, we stopped at the Sinks Canyon State Park. It's located on the middle fork of the Popo AG River. It's a great place for hiking, camping, and climbing. Well-tended trails take you down to the river. After driving through the high desert, it was a relief to be surrounded by cascading water. We watched as the stream mysteriously disappeared into a porous wall of limestone. It reappears a quarter of a mile downstream in a placid pool called the Rise. It takes about two hours for the water to make this short journey. Many large trout call the calm waters home. Unfortunately for anglers, this is a no fishing zone. The next day started beside the Bighorn River in Thermopolis, Wyoming. We were here to learn about the hot spring. Scalding water heated to 127 degrees oozes out of the ground. As it cools, minerals like lime and gypsum settle out, forming terraces. A boardwalk lets you walk among the terraces. Notice, almost every part of this terrace is wet. Totally unnatural. Totally managed. The desire to manage the hot springs is similar to what's seen at resorts in Baden-Baden, Germany. The hot springs here attracted a community of Germans early on in the game. 
Therefore, they have their, their cultural attitude has had an impact both in Thermopolis as well as how you take care of things. That impact is on this particular park. So you're looking at a state park that has nothing wild about it. There's nothing original here. It's all completely managed. Most tourists seem to like the manicured lawns, swimming, and the mineral pools. Now I want you to all put your hands in the air like that. Keep them up. Have to do something ridiculous once in a while. <laughs> Keep you in balance. 20 miles south of Thermopolis is the Wind River Canyon. Its towering walls contain rocks from nearly every era of the Earth's history. This granite down here is 2.5 billion years old, and this is 0.5 billion years old. You can take your hand and put it across a time gap that's half the age of the Earth. I'm spanning a time period of 2 billion years. As we left the canyon, we followed the Wind River Range and headed into the Shoshone National Forest. It was the first federally protected forest in the United States. It spans over 2.4 million acres. It encompasses sagebrush plains, spruce and fir forests, and craggy mountain peaks. It was also the escape route for Chief Joseph and his band of Nez Perce Indians. They were fleeing from the cavalry who wanted to force them onto a reservation. State Highway 296 is now called the Chief Joseph Scenic Byway. This highway intersects with Highway 212, dubbed America's Most Beautiful Road by Charles Corot. It's also called the Beartooth Highway. Starting outside of Red Lodge, Montana, it snakes its way south into Wyoming. Expansive vistas across broad wilderness reveal valleys carved out by glaciers as they worked their way through the Beartooth Range 30,000 years ago. The stunning landscape contains many trails and places to stop. It's ideal for day hikes or hardcore backpacking. There are almost a thousand lakes hidden away in this wilderness. Several have campgrounds close by. Over 10,000 feet at its highest point, discovering the Beartooth makes you feel like you're on top of the world. As we descended the Beartooth into Yellowstone National Park, we encountered a series of waterfalls. The first, Tower Falls in the Hanging Valley, was obscured by a growth of trees. What the National Park Service mentality is, is to leave everything natural. Well then, since there were none of these trees down below, all the way over there, at the time they first built this overlook, you could see the whole waterfall from bottom to top. Now why have an overlook when you can't even see it anymore? Now I'm not going to promote a felony, but I would compliment and give a medal to anyone who chopped these damn trees down so that you could see what the waterfall was all about. <laughs> Stupid! The Kodak Moment Liberation Cause was appealing, but our anger dissipated when we saw a nearby Inspiration Point. Many consider this to be the most scenic view in Yellowstone. Here, the river falls over 300 feet into the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. The red and yellow rock walls of the canyon are rhyolite, remnants of the volcanic eruption 630,000 years ago that formed the park. This awesome beauty masks the violent past that led to its creation. We find out that Yellowstone is still a volcanic hotspot. <laughs> The bubbling volcanic activity lies just beneath the surface. Yellowstone contains a diverse range of geysers, 
hot springs, and gurgling mud pots. It's a geothermal wonderland, unlike any other place on Earth. While entertaining, caution is in order, especially if you venture away from Old Faithful to some of the lesser known geothermal sites. The reason for not having you get any closer to this is the fact you can see it's a regular boiling spring, but look at the edges of it. It's thin, it might only be two inches thick, and it's, uh, and it's more than unstable, it will break off. There are no signs that warn people to stay back from the edge of the geyser pools or mud pots. If you're ever coming here with kids, you better have them on a leash or you'll hold them by the hand. And actually, my father would not let me into Yellowstone Park until I was 12. Duly warned, we were introduced to the mud volcanoes of Yellowstone. This is one of several mud volcanoes that you're going to see and you can hear periodic episodes. It'll get real active for a few minutes and then it'll kind of fade back. Then it'll burst out a great big chunk of mud because you can see the mud goes all the way up to the rim over there, the wet mud. And you've got a lot of steam and you could hear it before you even arrive. We can also smell it. The pots emit a rotten egg smell because sulfuric acid is generated. This acid dissolves the rock, forming silica and clay. Once mixed with water, it forms the bubbling mud pot. While dangerous, these curious features were some of the most memorable we encountered in the park. You fall down there, you're dead. You <laughs> fast. There is much to see in Yellowstone. It offers an almost endless supply of natural wonders and scenic beauty. But this will have to be the subject of another program. The next day, we left Yellowstone and ventured south to see the Grand Teton. This grand formation is a 40-mile-long mountain front rising from the valley floor some 6,000 feet. The Tetons were formed or uplifted out of the ground along a fault line during earthquakes over the past 13 million years. Seven glacial lakes surround the base of the range. More than 100 alpine lakes spread out through the backcountry. The lake's glistening surfaces form a mirrored skirt that draws your eyes to the peaks. The rugged Teton Range rises dramatically without an intermediate set of foothills. There are 12 peaks in the Tetons towering over 12,000 feet, a climber's paradise. The dark beauty of the rocks is softened by contrasting snow and ice. The vein-like snow fields and 12 glaciers blend with the clouds snared on the etched granite, creating a powerful canvas. We'd learned a lot about northern Wyoming, but we had to press on. After an overnight stop in Rock Springs, we were on the road to the southern end of the Bridger Teton National Forest. Our first stop, the Seatskadi National Wildlife Refuge. This area attracted hunters as the Ice Age ended 10,000 years ago. The Green River bisects the high desert sagebrush and creates an oasis for migrating birds. Our migration drew us to Kemmerer. This small town, population 3,000, launched a retail giant, J.C. Penney. The original store is still standing and still open for business after more than 100 years. While it may not compete with Bloomingdale's for style and selection, it does have its own charm and a few unique features. This is the Lansing system. It used to run the full length of the store. It's been moved up for antique purposes. None of the money was handled on the sales floor. It was all handled upstairs in the office. When the customer was ready, they would um, unscrew the little knob and put the money inside. They'd send it up to the office. The associate would make the change and send it back down to the sales floor. This eliminates worries about identity theft, but I don't think it'll make a comeback. J.C. Penney's modest home has been restored. Taking a tour is a good way to learn about it. 
He was actually born and raised in Hamilton, Missouri, and um, he was starting to develop tuberculosis, and so he had to go to a higher and drier climate. He got in with um, two partners, Johnson and Callahan, who owned the chain of the Golden Rule store at the time. They were going to open a store in Ogden, Utah, which had about 20,000 people at the time. And he knew this area, and he thought it would be better to start it in a smaller town so he could actually be friends with his customers. Penning lived in this house from 1902 to 1909. It seems pretty austere for a retail giant, but it was considered luxurious at the time. He was very frugal, and he didn't like people knowing his business, and so his daily sales books were kept in code. Just daily expenditures and what the store made during that particular day. We're not even sure if his wife knew the code. <laughs> We wanted to know why Kemmerer is called the fossil fish capital of the world. We drove out to the nearby Fossil Butte National Monument. 50 million years ago, this was a huge subtropical lake. Millions of fossil fish are buried in the sedimentary rock that surrounds the visitor center. This is a good place to begin the exploration of this ancient lake bed. The fossil displays and the artist's renderings bring the past to life. The staff can fill in the gaps. Fossil fish are what we're most known for. Abundant fish because this was an ancient lake. Uh, other than fish, we do get uh, crocodiles, alligators, so we get reptiles and lizards, uh, rare amphibians, but also birds, mammals, bats being the most common, and then leaves and insects. So we get all, the whole ecosystem is preserved here uh, in lake sediments. One recent find was a complete skeleton of a 50 million year old horse. The first horses were not much bigger than a dog. It's a relatively unknown part, and the fossils here surprise people. This is here, and they don't, they don't realize what's here. Visitors can hike the trails around the park to learn more about fossil collecting. But they may want to go on a dig at one of the nearby private quarries. Quarries like Tinsky's and Ulrich's provide visitors with a chance to dig their own fossil fish. Even professionals like Lance Grand from Chicago's Field Museum come here. We're out here uh, digging in some of the world's richest fossil beds, and uh, the Field Museum now has the world's largest collection of uh, fossils from Fossil Basin. If you don't have time for a dig, you still may want to check out Ulrich's gallery. Carl and Shirley Ulrich have been digging out here since 1947. But be careful, you may be inspired and have to go fishing for fossils. To wind up our Wyoming wanderings, we circled back toward Rock Springs for a drive south through the Flaming Gorge Scenic Byway. A trek across this ancient landscape was the perfect way to end our Wyoming trip through time. Thank you.